Um, we are now moving on to module three, which is going to be uh, network visualization and analysis using Cytoscape. And um, the way this one is going to be structured is uh, we're going to understand the advantages of network visualization. We're going to understand how to use Cytoscape. There's going to be um, at the end of this uh, lecture, everyone's going to get a chance to open up Cytoscape and try it out along with us. It is not a formal lab, but it's just an introduction to Cytoscape at the end, so you guys can get to play with it. In the lab we'll do after this whole lecture, you'll get to use Cytoscape a lot more. So I just want to introduce you to the basic features of Cytoscape um, and um, to show you how you can create and optimize a network within Cytoscape. Um, so first, we're just going to start off with a basic introduction to what network visualization is. Um, and um, as I said before, we're going to just demo Cytoscape at the end of the, this lecture as well. So uh, everyone's probably heard of the concept of six degrees of separation. Sorry, let me move this over. Um, so uh, it, was, it was actually, um, it's changed a lot over the last, I'd say, 20 years in that now everyone's part of social, um, why am I blanking on the word? The social network. Uh, everyone has Facebook, everyone has Twitter. We're all socially connected uh, in more ways than we would think. But originally, um, the concept was um, devised by Stan Stanley Milgram, who did an experiment in the 1960s at Harvard where he uh, mailed <laughs> uh, postcards to people and he asked them to uh, put their name on the postcard. And the object was to try and find um, if you knew the first person on the list. And he said, I want you to mail this postcard to somebody who you think might get you to the first person on the list. Now, if you knew the first person on the list, you would then mail your postcard back to Stanley Milgram. And what he found was on average, there was six degrees of separation that separated people. Um, it was also a popularized in the 1990s as a game called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Uh, in the Hollywood world, people said you can always um, connect two movies or you can connect movies based on Kevin Bacon and it was never more than six steps away from a given movie to another movie that had Kevin Bacon on it. So it's demonstrated the interconnectivity of our society, but um, it's more and more prevalent now on with Facebook and Twitter, you know, the people that you are connected to, you're often surprised that they're connected to people that you know, or they're related to people you know, because the world is just getting smaller and smaller. Um, but that is only one example of, you know, networks within society. How is this relevant to biology? These are just people. But in actuality, when we look at, um, I lost my mouse. Um, but it, in actuality, when we look at networks, uh, we can also apply this to the biological framework as well. And there are many different networks within um, biology that we can also um, use. It's not just um, social networks that we just discussed now. There's also networks within our nervous system. Um, there's networks within the cells of our body, cell, cell communication. And there's also molecular networks with protein-protein interaction networks or gene-gene interaction networks. Pathways are also um, a type of network. So there are many, many different network types um, that we can represent within biology as well. And here's just um, a few examples of some of the networks that we can see within biology over here. This was um, a cover of nature 150 years and it's just showing a beautiful network of all the connectivity they have. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a feature that we've seen probably everywhere now. Um, so why do we wanna use networks within biology? So they're very, very powerful tools in helping us to reduce uh, complexity. Um, they're more efficient than tables at representing our data. And I always say a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is actually um, a representation of a network from last year. I think it's from April, 2020. And this is um, the interaction of SARS, um, some SARS-CoV-2, which of course everybody knows about because we're all living in the SARS-CoV-2 era. <laughs> um, so over here on this network, the red diamonds are actually SARS-CoV-2 viral proteins. And this is showing the interaction of these proteins with, um, with human proteins. This was a protein-protein interaction um, study. Um, the thickness of the line is representing spectral count. So this is actually a proteomics um, analysis. And um, they're also showing 
um, areas in this network that represent protein complexes. So any sort of cluster of nodes where it's highlighted in yellow represents um, a specific protein complex that is being described in the literature or in a protein interaction network database. And they're also highlighting here biological process. So anything that's um, highlighted in blue is actually annotated with a given biological process. There are a few different examples, but in this uh, one picture, they've managed to represent a lot of information. And if you had to look at this information as written text in a, um, um, in a table, it would be very difficult to translate all of this information as text. So one of the first things that networks do for us in biology is they reduce the complexity and they efficiently show us a picture of what we're trying to say. Um, so um, why would we use uh, network visualizations for biological data? So there's, there's many, many different reasons. Um, number one, we can represent the relationship between different biological molecules, protein-protein interactions, genetic interactions, or functional interactions can all be represented in a network. Um, it is a useful way to discover relationships bet between our entities, whether they are pathways or whether they are genes. Um, you know, going through an Excel spreadsheet is very, very difficult to figure out the relationships between two genes, or that one gene might interact with 100 proteins versus another gene that doesn't interact with any of them. Getting that out of the table is very difficult. Once you represent it as a, a picture, it becomes a lot easy easier. Another thing it does very, very well, as demonstrated in the previous picture, is that you can um, integrate lots of different data, right? So in the previous network I showed, there were different um, organisms that proteins were come from. And so that was a different shape of molecule and different shape of color, as well as bringing in annotation data, complex data, as well as the actual interaction data. So um, it's very good at integrating different types of data. Network analysis also allows us to do a lot of other fun things, like we can find subnetworks within our network. So in the previous picture, again, we had complexes that you could clearly see a group of genes that all interact together and form some sort of unit and act um, accordingly. You can also find paths when you're looking for um, the relationship between node A and node B and how they're connected to each other. Um, and then another common term that we look at is our hub proteins or hub genes, right? So there's a, a, a node in your network that actually is more important than other nodes. It connects a lot of different things. If you remove that node from the network, then certain aspects of the networks can start to deteriorate. It's called the hub of a network. So there's a lot of things that we can learn from um, these networks. So just a few examples, um, we've mentioned quite a few of these already, but you know, there's um, the idea of detecting protein complexes from protein-protein interaction networks, gene, sorry, proteins that tend to um, associate with each other to, to fulfill a given task, right? We've seen a lot of, you've probably heard of a lot of different complexes that there are within the cell. Um, so then we can also um, use networks to help us find gene function. So on um, tomorrow, I think we're gonna be looking at a, a program called Gene Mania that hopes, that looks to group genes together by their functional associations. Um, so if you have a given gene that you might not know a lot of information about it, you can infer um, some of its properties based on the other genes that it interacts with. So you can use your network to uh, help explain something that you don't know so much about. So that's the concept is the gene function prediction. Um, but as well, there's a lot of other things we can look at. We can look at specific motifs. We can look at network alignment, comparing two networks from different species, trying to fill in pieces that might be missing or trying to align them and see how they're similar. Um, and a lot of what we're gonna be doing here um, later on today as well is uh, pathway um, analysis using our network. So how do we represent our pathways as a network to summarize the information that we've done earlier this morning? So just the basics of a network, a network consists of nodes and the nodes can be anything. You define what your network is. So a node can be a gene, it can be a protein, it can be a transcript, it can be a drug, it can be microRNA, it can be anything that you define it to be. It can also be a person if you're looking at a social network and the connections of different people. Uh, within biology, a social network that people tend to look at is how people publish together. So if two people publish together, they get a, an edge that connects them and you can see the different networks of people that tend to publish together and what they publish. Um, but in this context, a node can also be a pathway, a group of genes, 
right? So it can be anything that you define it to be. And the reason why I mentioned pathways here is because that's what we're going to be focusing on um, later part of today. An edge is a connection between our two nodes. And it can be a genetic interaction. It could be a physical protein interaction. It can be two genes that are expressed at the same time. It could be a microRNA protein um, interaction, meaning the microRNA um, binds to the this protein and it affects its expression. It could be anything that you define. It's the basics of, of a network. So some features of the networks that we like to look at are the topological features. These, this is the, the general uh, trends that we see in the networks, including the number of nodes and the number of edges. Um, we can look at the node degree. So that's the number of connections any given node has. Um, we can also look at the degree distribution across the network. Um, you know, certain areas of the network, a lot of the genes are highly connected. Their node, their node degree is much higher. Um, and then we can also look at clustering coefficients, how genes cluster together. Um, these are just different topological features we can take from the network. Um, I've mentioned this uh, previously, we have something, the concept of a hub versus a subnetwork. So in this example network that I have over here, um, this MKRN1 is a hub of this network. It is connected to um, a lot of other nodes. If we take this node out, then um, you'll see that a lot of things become disconnected. A hub is something that pulls a lot of disconnected things together. It's a vital part of the network. Um, you can also have subnetworks, meaning that you can look at um, a certain subsection of the network to look at just its connectivity. Um, and another thing this shows as well, it's, you know, we, we have we have our mkRNA as the, as the main key or the focus of this network, um, but also we have two different types of nodes in this network. We have apoptotic genes as well as transcription factors. And, you know, it's showing different relationships within this network. There's two different color um, edges as well. When a protein interacts with another protein, the edge is blue. But when a transcription factor is targeting a um, protein in this network, the interaction is shown as green. So there's a lot of different things that we can represent in this, in, in this network, but it's also very good at, there's different ways of presenting our data. And often networks can be very, very large. And the next thing we need to focus on is how we can use it as a tool to, um, uh, express what we're trying to conclude or what we're trying to portray. And so over here, I have three different, sorry, four different examples of the exact same network, but shown in different ways. And, and um, we're using what we have in this network to, to portray the information. In, in, um, a, in, in uh, area A of this plot, we have the mass correct analysis of 400 protein-protein uh, interactions in uh, pneumonia, pneumonia microbe. Um, and in section B, we've taken a subset of that network. And if you look carefully at this network, you can actually, you can actually see that the center area is the actual subnetwork that we focused on. We focused on um, an individual protein and all of its interactions. The third um, represent the B and C are the exact same representation of the network but we've just laid it out very, very differently. And what we've done is we've manually clustered um, genes that are highly interconnected. There are tools within Cytoscape that will help you find these clusters, right? There's cluster analysis directly in them. And it's clustered um, three, of, three sets of genes into, into a highly interconnected cluster. And when we've laid them out according to the cluster, it's a different representation of the exact same picture. And further, in D, we've actually collapsed these clusters. So you can see the genes that are interacting with the clusters. You've taken out that, that level of detail in order to try and summarize the network. And so there's different ways we can present the data, even though the data underlying it is actually the same. And it's important, especially when you're trying to uh, focus in on a given idea. So the one thing that unfortunately is missing within Cytoscape or within network analysis are uh, the actual dynamics, right? So when you think of a pathway, you think of the flow of information from one, one step to the end. And um, networks, although they can have directionality, um, they, they lack this aspect of dynamics and moving from point A and point B. That's a different sort of set of tools. Um, and it also misses a lot of the mathematical representations that of, of um, 
uh, models. So networks in general um, are very, very useful tools. So I just demonstrated briefly that they're useful in showing relationships in large data. Um, it's important to define and understand what your nodes and edges mean, right? So there's lots of different things that we can represent in networks, but it's also important to define what we are using it for. Um, it's also important to define the biological question and what you're trying to show to your user. Um, and there are many different available um, methods for gene lists and network analysis. So we're gonna look at a few of them right now. But before we move on, I wanna discuss Cytoscape specifically. So we're gonna be using a tool called Cytoscape. Um, it's a network visualization and analysis uh, software. Um, it is uh, an open source platform for visualizing and analyzing complex networks. Um, I'm just showing you a little bit of like different pictures over here, right? Because there, are, it's not just related to biological networks. You can represent whatever you want in Cytoscape. It's just defining what your network represents. So over here is just actually showing you um, a represented, it's like a, a, a flow diagram, a, a workflow diagram. Um, represented as a network as well. Um, so there's a lot of different uses you can have. Cytoscape, as I said, is open source and it's supported by um, a lot of different um, institutions. It's actively developed um, and they're still working on Cytoscape. They still release it. Um, I think it started uh, 20 years ago. Um, and so it's come a long way from when it started. Uh, I think the original publication was from 2001. It's developed in Java. And um, the develop, some of the development happens um, in Toronto, um, but there's also another uh, main hub in um, California as well. Um, so some of the, like a few things, I guess, that we can do within Cytoscape, right? We can manipulate networks, meaning a lot of the stuff that I've demonstrated um, up until now has been done within Cytoscape, right? You can change the visual attributes of anything in your network. There are a lot of features you can um, fine tune. Um, you can filter networks. You can bring in networks from multiple different places. You don't necessarily have to come with a network already. So within Cytoscape, there's the ability to search um, a lot of public databases that are out there that have already represented their data as networks. We're gonna go over Gene Mania tomorrow, um, but there are a few other ones that you can use directly from within Cytoscape. And another thing that's very, very convenient is they have a lot of um, automatic layouts um, that are available for you to use, right? So you don't necessarily have to lay everything out. They have a lot of um, layouts that you can, that optimizes the, the separation between your nodes and can clean up your picture a lot um, done automatically. Another beautiful thing about Cytoscape is that um, it is an open source um, ecosystem, but it also allows for people to develop their own apps. And you know there are over 360 apps that have been developed for Cytoscape over the years. A lot of them are still maintained. Um, some of them, as they become more and more used, become core apps, and then the app, the actual Cytoscape developers, incorporated into the core, um, into the core code base and it, it's released all the time and you don't have to worry about that. Some apps are, are developed by third parties and you are reliant on them keeping their app up to date and working, but a lot of them do. Um, within our lab, we have developed quite a few Cytoscape apps that we use all the time and that we're constantly adding new features to because these are apps that we use all the time. We're gonna introduce that in the second half of this um, lecture. Um, so, yeah, Cytoscape has um, a great tutorial page, which I hope everyone did in the um, in the pre-work. Um, it has been cited thousands of times. And as I said, there's over 360 apps um, that you can use from. So now is the time, I guess, we're gonna actually try out Cytoscape. So as I'm going through this, I'd like you guys to open up Cytoscape and try the same things as I'm trying as, I'm trying as well. So I'll just quickly go over what I'm gonna go over and then I'll do it also live. So, oops, ugh. that work? Yeah, okay. Here's, here's what you'll, you'll kind of see when you open up Cytoscape. You won't see this network yet because we haven't gotten to loading that in that network. But on the left hand of the screen, we have a network manager. Um, it, sorry, no. 
On the left hand of the screen, we have um, the control panel. And the control panel actually has many different tabs and they're lined up on the left hand side over here. By default, you should always see network, style, filter, um, and annotate, I believe. Um, oh, actually, and also layout tools as well. Those are the ones that are, are commonly there. Um, if you install and use a different app, sometimes that app will also add an additional um, tab over here on the left hand side. But what you'll see is that it will it will kind of make it fatter, right? You might have two lines of tabs. Um, the network manager tab is always going to list all the networks that you have. Um, on the bottom of the, the Cytoscape main panel, you'll, you have the table panel. And again, the table panel will always have the node table, the edge table, and the network table. The node table describes uh, any attributes you have associated with the nodes. Uh, the edge table describes anything that's associated with the edges and, and also with the network. Network is anything that's associated with the, the network. So for a given node, you might have, uh, you know, let's say you have a gene. And that gene might have a description associated with it. And it also might have an expression value associated with it. You can associate anything you want with your node or your edges. Um, and Cytoscape allows you to load them in very, very easily from an Excel spreadsheet or from a tab delimited file. It's, it's very easy, but hopefully we'll go through that a little bit more. In the corner of th this main part where your network is, is called your canvas. In the bottom uh, right hand corner, it's um, it has a bird's eye view. And if you move this, blue box over here, it will move your network as well. And over on the right hand side, you'll have a results panel. And also um, a lot of um, apps will give you information in the results panel. So we'll be using that as well. Just a little bit more detail about the basic navigation at the top. So um, uh, these are standard, um, I guess, navigational tools that you've seen before. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Um, this one over here with the two arrows um, fits the entire network in the view, right? So if you want to like automatically just pan out to everything. Um, the one with the check mark is if you have selected nodes, it will um, zoom into your selection. Um, this, these two little arrows over here is going to apply your preferred layout. So if you move things around, you want to move things back, you can move things back right away. Um, one thing I think is important to, to mention is Sometimes we'll like try out different uh, um, different layouts. And we don't like what we get. Um, so the Cytoscape kind of behaves like other programs. If you do Command or Control Z, you can undo your action. Um, also within the, the navigation bar, you can just go File, Undo um, if you want to go back, especially if you've like worked hours on getting something perfect and then you accidentally like clicked on Apply Preferred Layout. It's not something you want. Um, these are another, a few other shortcuts. Uh, shortcuts you can hide selected nodes and edges with this um, this eye, uh, and next to it is you can select first neighbors of selected nodes. A neighbor of a node is anything that's connected to it. So if you have a selected node, you want to know all of. Let's say you've selected a gene, you want to know all of the genes that that node interacts with. You click on the first neighbors, and it will highlight everything that's connected to the node that you have selected. You can do it for one, you can do it for two, you can do it for however you want. It's basically expanding your network to like everything that's connected to it. Um, and then of course, uh, on the other side over here, you also have um, the ability to quickly import network tables and networks, save your session, open a session um, and search within index. Index is a, um, a library of networks. Um, so the idea is this is actually something that's affiliated with Cytoscape that you know, if somebody uh, publishes a paper and publishes a network, there's the ability to take that network and put it on the cloud so that somebody who's reading the paper says, oh, oh, I want to like take a look at this guy's data. They can pull that network directly into Cytoscape and play with it directly. So it's like a, a library of networks. We're going to use that in a second. So, um, okay. So now I'm going to open up my Cytoscape so you guys can follow along with me a little bit more. Um, give me a second. Okay. So within Cytoscape, we're going to load in a network. So in the, in the top left hand um, bar, you'll see the index in your network panel. You'll see the little index. Um, oh, actually, I don't know if you will see the index up here first. There's a little arrow next to it. These are all the databases that you can search from. So you have um, Gmania, Intact, uh, Intact's approaching protein interaction database. Um, the fourth one down, I think, should be Index, which is our uh, library of networks. Um, some of the few below it, we have Psychic, which is actually um, 
a service that tries to collect all of the protein protein interaction net network databases together. And you can search that. Um, um, Stitch is a compound related database. Um, and then String um, is similar to Gene Mania. It's um, also a, a database that tries to collect all different connections between genes. And lastly, you have Wiki Pathways. We're going to use Index. Um, and what I have put here is SARS um, because, you know, it's the world we're living in right now. Why not? And if you click on search, um, it should pull up a bunch of networks. Um, but actually, I want you to choose a specific network. So um, in this table, if you click on name, it will sort according to name. And then I want you to um, scroll down to where it says um, IMEX. And it's a bunch of IMEX is a, a standard for protein-protein interactions. Um, and so I want you to click on the IMEX intact coronavirus data set full detail. And next to that, you'll see a little green download button, I guess. And if you click on it, it will pull the network into the Cytoscape for you. Just give it a second and it will load it up. Okay, so now you should have a network in front of you. And um, let me go back to my screen over here. Um, Maybe you should stop here and ask people a yes if they get to that image. Okay. To that loading. Just to, you is don't it, want to lose people right the or are just, just showing the... It's just, it's just yeah. a demo, but I yeah. want people oh, yeah. to like, yeah. Go ahead. So they're doing it at the same time, right? Yeah. Or they're not? I don't think so. They're the practice after. Yeah. This is, so... Um, okay. What sorry. Is, I take it back. Sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. No, no. It's, it's, uh, this is, it's supposed to be a demo, right? Like, I want you guys to play along with it as well. Right? I just so wanted to the demo. I need to stop the recording. So uh -huh. that's why. No, no, no. It's, it's not, it's not a lab. It's okay. just a demo. Okay, perfect. It's just, yeah. Hopefully I'm not going too quickly that people can't keep up. So just a few kind of things you're going to look at, right? So right away, you'll see there's lots of different colors in this network. There's a lot of different things that are represented in the network. So I just want to briefly go over what we have here, right? So um, on the left-hand side in Cytoscape, yeah, I'm going backwards between this, uh, underneath network, you'll see a tab called styles. Um, now this is where, um, this is where the person who made this network would have defined all of the attributes of this network. If you look at the uh, node table as well, you'll see that each node has a lot of information associated with it. It has um, a name, it has an alias, it has a taxonomy identifier. If you scroll down, you'll see there's multiple taxonomies represented here. Um, and it has a lot of other information. So what, um, what the people who created this network, they took that information and tried to map them to visual, visual um, aspects of it. So when you open the style browser, you'll see that there's node, edge, and network, right? We can define um, attributes to a node, to an edge, or to a network. So what you'll also notice here is that there's two different, there's three different columns. Um, DEF stands for default. So that's the default way the node will look. Uh, MAP stands for mapping. You want to take an attribute and you want to map it to something. And bypass means that you have a given node that maybe doesn't fit into the class of what you're trying to define. So you want to define it directly, right? You want to bypass everything else and put what you want. Uh, none of these nodes actually have bypasses, but you'll see they do have mappings. So if the third one from the top, I don't know if it'll be the same for you, but for me, it's the third one, it says fill color. And if I go to um, the arrow on the right-hand side and expand it, you'll see this is all of their mapping, right? So um, every single one, they're mapping these uh, colors to species, right? The, the top you'll see column species and they probably haven't done this um, manually. You don't worry, because like you can see there's tons of different colors, right? So Cytoscape has the ability to, you know, you've given that column that has unique names and it just assigns a color to it, right? So it does it automatically for you. But what it's doing here is for every single species, um, it's giving it a different color. Um, and that's, that's the definition in the colors over here. And I'm gonna assume also, um, we see a lot of blue, I'm gonna guess blue is human. If I scroll down, um, I actually don't see human. 
yeah, here it is, yeah. So human is blue, right, which is type of blue. There's a lot of information in this one specific attribute. So that's just one example. You can then collapse this and look at some of the other things that they've um, defined, right? So shape over here is also another thing that they've defined. You can expand it and you can see that um, they're representing genes as diamonds, um, uh, peptide or protein as circles, um, and small molecule as a triangle. Um, so you can see that certain things, I guess, are defined as uh, uh, different types, but they're attributing the same shape to it because it's basically all the same thing. Um, so there's lots of different things you can associate or um, map in your attributes. Let's go back here. So here's a brief overview of what they did in this network. So node properties over here was mapped to shape and the fill color, even though I showed you in the original, in the actual network has tons of them. Um, I've only, I've cut that down over here to just the main colors, right? Um, because these are probably experiments that they've pulled from lots of different publications and they might've been done in different species. But the gist of this network is that, you know, you're looking at SARS-CoV-2 proteins, which are red and human that are blue. There are also a lot of mouse and rat in there as well because they've been tested in those species as well. Um, another thing that I focused on here also was um, edge color. Cause as you can see, there's a lot of different edge colors within this network and they're actually, um, defined by the um, experiment that was used in order to find them. So there's a lot of information in this network. And I, I would say that a lot of the time you don't wanna see a massive network, but hopefully if you're trying to um, focus on your conclusion, you'll, you'll, um, you'll zoom into a network, something like this, it's a lot smaller that is better at portraying the picture. So the one thing I want you also to give a try is to try out some different layouts, right? There's lots of different layouts within Cytoscape. Um, and how you would try out the layouts in the top bar, um, uh, you'll see a, an option called layout and you can do any one of these things, these layouts, there's the grid layout, obviously not very good, but it can be useful for certain aspects, not for this network. Um, a lot of these features are, uh, um, the one that I tend to like is the profuse. So there's different types of layouts that you can try out. Yeah. Okay. okay, lastly, I just want to mention that there are different types of networks that you can load within the Cytoscape. So I just want to, um, just mentioned another one. So uh, the one thing that kind of lacks within Cytoscape is it's, it's, it's optimized for network representation and not necessarily um, for your traditional pathway representations, um, but there are pathways available. And so what I have here is um, I have an example wiki pathways pathway that I've loaded in from wiki pathways um, that is this is just an example of the androgen receptor. And what you can see here is in their representation and these published networks that are on the cloud uh, they do have that beautiful flow. Um, this is not using any sort of layout within Cytoscape. Somebody has manually loaded in this network and created this beautiful view. And it's, it is available within Cytoscape. It's just not as, um, it's not available for all network types. There's specific networks that you can pull in that has this information. So um, before we go on to the next part here, I'm gonna pause and, and ask if there are any questions because I don't wanna like jump to the next part. We're good? Okay, so give me one second. Okay, so the next part that we're gonna go over is specifically a specific um, Cytoscape uh, app called the enrichment map. And we're gonna connect what we did this morning with what we just went over with network biology. So how is all this Cytoscape stuff relevant to all of the enrichment analysis we did this morning? Um, and over here, I've just listed a bunch of the uh, different apps that we're gonna be using within Cytoscape for the rest of the afternoon. So 
hopefully uh, by the end of this lecture, you'll understand how to transform the enrichment results you got this morning from G Profiler and GSCA into a beautiful network. Um, and you're going to understand the differences between a network as we just discussed and an enrichment map, which is a specific type of network. And hopefully you'll be able to summarize your enrichment results with um, using um, apps such as auto annotate, which is uh, an amalgamation of multiple apps, including cluster maker, word cloud, and auto annotate, pulls in a whole bunch of apps together. So in the first part of our uh, morning this morning, we uh, generated a lot of enrichment results. We generated enrichment results from GSEA and we generated enrichment results from GProfiler. And um, you guys hopefully got a chance to look at the results that came out. They were these beautiful spreadsheets that everyone loves. Everyone loves spreadsheets. We can do so much with them, right? <laughs> um, we see them all the time over and over again. But how does that help us uh, understand what pathways our um, genes are enriched in, right? It's, it's a huge list that nobody wants to go through. Um, so how do we how do we translate these into something that we can use a little bit more efficiently? So the general framework of pathway and network analysis is you have your experimental data and you define it, you, you um, create a list of it, whether it's the sublist from G profiler, or whether you use the whole list, you run it through an, an enrichment type of test, you give it a bunch of pathways, and then at the end, you get a list of enriched pathways. So you went from one list to another list, right? List of genes that are over representation to now a list of pathways. So how do we, we, we kind of solve this, right? So again, this morning, right? We had our ranked list of genes up and down. We used uh, G profiler initially, and then we used GSCA um, and we brought a bunch of pathways and we've outputted now our pathways that are upregulated and our pathways that are downregulated. So in the previous part of this talk, I mentioned networks, right? We know the basic um, aspects of the network. We know that it consists of nodes and it consists of edges and we can define what our nodes are. So traditionally people think of networks as protein-protein interactions, right? So, or gene-gene interactions or drug-protein interactions. But now we're gonna think of it a little bit differently and we're gonna think of it as an enrichment map. And what is an enrichment map? An enrichment map is, um, where each node is a pathway or a gene set, okay? So now, instead of being an individual gene, it's actually a group of genes. And the size is correlated to the number of genes that are associated with that pathway. And then the represents um, whether or not it's upregulated or downregulated. Um, that's in a given um, example where we're comparing class A to class B. It can also represent um, which um, single cell cell type it's associated with, right? The color can actually be what we define it as well. An edge between our two pathways is actually the genes they have in common. So why is this so important? Um, a lot of the pathways that we're pulling um, have a lot of associations with each other. They're, they're, they're highly similar, especially for data sources such as um, what we're gonna discuss tomorrow, Reactome as an example, um, it's a hierarchical representation, meaning that there's a sub pathway that exists within another sub pathway, which exists in another pathway, right? They're, they're all related to each other. They have similar genes in common. There's a lot of redundancy in the pathway databases. Also within between databases, you have Go that describes this pathway and you have Reactome that describes the exact same pathway. They might be slightly different for the way they've represented it, but both of those are results are gonna come out in our analysis because we've used as many pathways as we can get. So a lot of the data that we have is a little bit redundant. So when we create this enrichment map where each pathway is um, a node and, and the genes that connect them that are similar between them, um, are connected to each other, then we're reducing some of that redundancy. G pathways that are highly associated or highly similar are gonna group together and we're gonna be able to summarize our data a little bit better. So just to go into the details of the overlap that we're talking about here, right? So if we have um, a given set of gene, uh, a given set of gene sets, right? Where each node is a gene set and we're connecting them by the number of genes they have in common. And it's not a direct interaction. It's actually the genes they have in common. How do we do that? We're gonna use um, a statistic called the overlap 
in order to connect genes together. Um, and what we do is for every single gene set, we're gonna calculate the intersection, the, the genes that they have in common, and we're gonna divide it by the minimum number of genes between one of these sets, meaning that this set over here, let's say it has five genes, we'll divide it by the minimum, which is five. And that will give us a statistic of how much these genes, um, how much these two gene sets have in common. And that's how we translate it into a network. So if we're given our results, right, we have a tabular format of our results where um, each, each, each row in this table is a gene set and it's associated with its given p-value or FDR value. Um, we're now gonna translate each one of these rows into a node. And whenever two nodes are um, associated with each other, we'll get an edge. And, and what we're gonna be left with is um, a network representing all of our pathways. So there's a, a bunch of different um, use cases we can have um, for this analysis, right? So you can have a, a single, what we're gonna go over in um, the lab, you can have a single uh, two uh, data comparison. You're comparing two different classes. You, um, um, you create your ranked list, you run GSCA, and what, we're, what you're gonna get in the end is a network of all the pathways that are overrepresented. Blue being your upregulated, sorry, red being your upregulated, blue being your downregulated pathways. And over here is the demonstration, the first demonstration of uh, an, an enrichment map. And what we have here is we have clusters of pathways um, that we've annotated with overall themes because they all represent um, similar pathways, right? Um, the network looks large and you think you have a lot of results, but actually um, it's more that the, the functions that are grouping together are highly annotated functions. So it doesn't matter the size of the network because we can actually collapse this network to just a few different um, categories that are being upregulated and downregulated. You could zoom in onto any one of these clusters to get more details. So if we look more closely, each one of these nodes represents an individual pathway that are all, rep all um, associated with microtubule cytoskeleton, right? How we, do, how we classify those, um, these labels, we'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, another use of uh, enrichment map could be um, a case where we're looking at the comparison of two different enrichments, right? So uh, we've actually progressed over the years, right? So we started with one and then you can also look at comparing two. So in this case, in enrichment map, you're giving it two different pathway analyses and we're using uh, node attributes a little differently here because now the inside of the node is one um, one pathway result and the outside of the node or the node border is um, the second pathway analysis. And now you can highlight where the two analyses are different and you can also show where they are the same, right? So if you have a node that's all red, you know that it is the same for both of those analyses where you have the inside white and the outside red, it's, it's highlighting a difference. So also within the enrichment map, you can, you can zoom in on the expression of a given pathway. So over here, highlighting um, an individual node um, that is different between our different classes. Over here, we were, we were comparing uh, 12 hours versus 24 hours of estrogen treated cells. Um, and you, if you zoom in on just this individual gene set that shows you that there's a difference between these two different time points, you can see that the expression is clearly different between 12 and 24 hours. Um, and within in enrichment map, you can actually zoom in onto these individual genes. And I mentioned um, when we were doing the lab for GSEA, the concept of the leading edge. And so um, those are the genes that are actually causing the enrichment. So at this point, you can actually zoom in and see the genes that are associated with this pathway that is clearly different between these two types. So there's a lot of information that we're able to represent in our enrichment map. Um, another thing that next use case, I guess we're able to um, use enrichment map for um, is um, highlight certain genes that um, are part of um, given pathways. We call it, um, a query set analysis, a post analysis. Now this is where I mentioned in Slack where you would uh, use a micro, a micro RNA type analysis. Let's say you have a given microRNA that you know is overexpressed in a, um, 
in a given experiment or a given, a given, in, given, set, given data set, you can then ask the question, okay, I've done a pathway analysis on the expression between these two control versus um, disease. Now I wanna find out where those microRNA targets that I know is upregulated, which pathways they belong to. And you could then add this in as a post analysis and it will highlight the connections between them. This is actually showing you the microRNA targets of 125A, the predicted targets. Um, and anywhere you have an edge over here, um, that pathway, has one of the microRNA targets. You can click on that edge, you can see what that gene is. Uh, there are a different set of statistics you can use here. You can just look for the presence or absence of a given gene, but you can also use something, um, the Mann-Whitney test, for instance, so that you can um, highlight pathways that actually have highly ranked genes that are also microRNA targets. So this is another use case that we have for the enrichment map as well. Now last, um, Gary showed this picture when, um, uh, Gary showed this picture when he did his session this morning. Um, this was the different append 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 sorry, can't say. <laughs> different types of cancer, uh, different subtypes of, a, of the, the cancer in question here. Um, and um, what you're doing here is you actually have multiple data sets. There are nine different pathway analysis they have here and they're coloring the data set based on the, uh, they're coloring it based on which subtypes it belongs in. And um, I, I want to just mention here that like I'm showing pictures of networks and they're all very, very beautiful. They, they don't start like this. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of work to get to a, a figure that looks like this. Um, and it can be overwhelming at times. Uh, sometimes it's better to simplify the network as much as possible and, and, and understand what you're trying to show because uh, you know I've spent hours and hours making some of these figures. It's not, it's not as easy as I'm making it seem. So this figure, the reason why I say it for this figure alone is because there's a lot of um, pathways that are found in multiples of these, right? So how you organize this um, has got to be very, very challenging. But that being said, there's still a lot of information that can be found here. Um, okay, so those are just a, a few use cases of the enrichment map, which we're gonna use in lab three. Um, lastly, so within Cytoscape, I guess, uh, you've seen the basic network. When you load Cytoscape, as I said, a lot of apps will add a tab over here. So now you'll see that I have an enrichment map tab over here. And this is the input panel for enrichment map. I've already created my enrichment map over here. If you wanna see the app panel, you have to click on this little plus sign and the lab will walk you through how you input the files that it needs to create. But there are a few things that you can um, you can uh, play around with once you've actually created your network. Um, you can adjust your Q value, your FDR value that you've used when creating your network. It will basically remove nodes that don't pass that threshold. Um, you can do the same thing with your, your edges. If your network is too connected, you can play around with these slider bars and try and um, uh, reduce some of the connectivity in your network, make sure it's not like a hairball. Over here, um, the add signature gene sets, that's um, the ability that I mentioned before is over here. Um, you can change how the nodes are colored. So by default, they're covered, they're colored by their NES score, their normalized enrichment score. If you have multiple data sets, uh, one of the features over here, you can drop it down. Uh, you can color by data sets. So that was the um, example case uh, number four, where we have multiple data sets. So Cytoscape will automatically um, color it for you. Uh, in the table browser, enrichment map adds an extra tab. It's, it's called the heat map. And that's where, you know, I have selected a bunch of uh, nodes over here. And so it's showing you in the heat map, the expression of all of the genes that are associated with my selection. If you select an individual node, only if you select an individual node and only if you are using GSEA, it's only applicable to GSEA, um, you'll see something like this. This is, um, your heat map. I've expanded my heat map. So I'm not just because in the original picture I showed you a second ago, it was collapsed, right? So this is an expanded version where it's showing me all of the expression. Um, anything highlighted in yellow over here um, is the leading edge. So these are the genes that are contributing to the enrichment of this individual gene set that I've selected. Um, again, this is only for GSEA type results. So one other thing I want to mention, oops, is once we've created our um, enrichment map, 
um, large interconnected bunch of genes. The next thing we like to do is we like to annotate it. Um, and you saw in a lot of the figures, I had uh, large networks with circles drawn around them. And um, those circles are actually drawn um, uh, computationally, right? So I don't have to manually go through it. We have another app, it's called Auto Annotate. And Auto Annotate uses two other apps that we also, uh, one of them is ours and one of them is a base of Cytoscape. So Cluster Maker 2 is a core app within Cytoscape. I believe it's core app, um, but it's not our app. Um, and what Cluster Maker and WordCloud and Auto Annotate, what they all do is they take your network, they cluster it. So they find nodes that are um, highly interconnected within each cluster. They then look at all of the node labels um, and using WordCloud, I don't know if people have seen the you know, word art where they take somebody's speech and then they, you know, they, uh, they put in big, like the, the words they say the most often. So it's the same concept. They use a word cloud. They grab all of the descriptions of all of our pathways and they count how many times the words are appearing within your selection. And it grabs the three most um, used words and it uses those to annotate your network. Now, it doesn't always do a great job. You don't have to take what it's defined as, as your label. You can manually change those labels and we do that often, right? Because even though it says one thing, if you actually looked at the functions, they, they might be a little bit different or maybe I interpret them a little bit different. Um, it's just done so it's easier for you to annotate your network quickly. So, oops. There, okay, so here, this is just, oh, my machine's doing, sorry. Let me try this again, there, okay. So I just went over it like uh, verbally, but this is what the, the network what auto annotate does. It clusters the network and then for each cluster, it finds the frequent words and the node labels, it grabs those three words and it puts the annotation there. Um, by default, uh, the labels will be, um, this will be scaled such that the larger the cluster, the larger the label is. Um, I don't like that personally because um, just because something is annotated really well, just because there's a lot of nodes associated with a given cluster does not mean that it's more important necessarily. It just means that it's being annotated. An individual node, they don't, there's only one node for it, could be just as important. Maybe it's just a function that's not very well described. And it might be something that's just as interesting. So often when I uh, create my enrichment map and I annotate it, the first thing I'll do is change that. There's a little setting on the side of auto annotate where you can just say, don't scale it according to the number of nodes. And that's the first thing I usually do. So, uh, I don't know why I keep doing this. Um, so this is kind of within Cytoscape what you're gonna see. Um, so after you run auto annotate, all of your clusters um, are laid out on the left-hand side. You can click on an individual one, and it will highlight that one. You can right click on it, you can change its name. Um, you can remove it. And over here on the, um, right hand side, you'll see that there's an auto annotate um, display window. And right here, you can see uh, the, the feature I just mentioned before scale font by cluster size. You can unselect it. Um, and then your nodes will be all the, no, the node sizes will be all the same. Not the node sizes, sorry. The, no, the cluster labels will all be the same. Okay, another feature that I find very useful within auto annotate is the ability to, to collapse your clusters. As I keep on saying, um, the size of the cluster is not important, right? It just indicates that that certain, that feature happens to be very well annotated in the data. Um, and so often a, a easy way to simplify um, the network is to collapse those clusters. So what I have here is an example of, you know, this large network up here, that's, sorry, um, a large network that is being collapsed into just this, just to its important clusters. And it's a lot easier to portray a message with a smaller, uh, less busy network. So that's another feature of auto annotate that's very, very useful. Okay. Um, so last but not least, I guess, um, is this was another example that, um, that Gary mentioned this morning with the um, autism data set. So this just shows everything all in one, I guess, right? So we have an enrichment map with our red nodes. We have um, post analysis edges here, which are the genes associated with autism that are our triangles. We have uh, nodes that have been um, 
oh, sorry, functions that have been annotated, not with auto annotate at the time, because this is an old network, um, but a lot of the features that we now have were put in place because we were doing so much stuff manually that we figured out a way how to do it automatically. And this is just another view of a beautiful network. And hopefully you guys too will be able to create this network, but not today, one day. 